Well, welcome to God's Got Good News Church. This beautiful December 3rd day here in El Paso. It is warm. It is comfortable. Um, again, as we continue today, we'll continue our series, What Stopped Your Progress? Now, if you've been following us, this is the fourth iteration, episode, iteration, whatever you want to call it. Um, of what stops your progress and just to give you a little update we did one two and three uh, our last week was strife control and retaliation um, today we're going to cover accusations rejection insecurity and jealousy now after today for next week we want you to come and join because next week we're going to start looking at how these demons enter what what gives them their rights to walk in how do they walk in and we're going to talk about getting rid of them okay because it's so important that if we know how they get in we know who they are and we can recognize them then we got to get them out okay we got to get them out because we don't want them all right at least you shouldn't want them let's put it that way you shouldn't want them okay and like i said before in the beginning there's like 52 groups of um common demon groupings and in during this series we may cover them all it's a lot to cover my friend because normally under each grouping there's a minimum of two or more most of the time it's three or four or more and so that tells you that if you are a god-fearing person that the enemy is he's at work he has layers and layers he can put on you to put you in bondage and that's what we're about. First, we identify. If you're not familiar with my uh, series, I'm walking in Jesus's authority on YouTube, go check it out. We talk about the first part we just finished was 12 episodes, and it was talk. And the first part is walking in Jesus's authority, because if we have to understand that we can't do anything unless we have the authority. Okay, someone just off the street, not saved, not serving the Lord can't do anything without having the authority jesus christ came he gave us that authority that teaching that we just finished on that one there is a sermon on the mount where jesus is laying down some ground rules i, I like to call it basic training okay because that's the way i look at it being a military person it's basic training so now today we, we're coming in Follow that one. That one's going to start taking a little bit of change since we finished that one. But today we come in and we want to talk about these four here that have much underneath each one of them. I think only one of them only has two, but most of them have three, four, and five, and six. And so it's very important that this is my claimer, disclaimer, whatever you want to call it. In Hosea, the first sentence of Hosea 4, 6 is, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The reasons why Satan gets through and gets stuff and demonic gets stuff in our lives is because we don't know. We don't know how he does things. We don't know his methods. We don't know anything. So we're kind of like shooting in the dark. But this takes us to a different level, okay? It takes us to a different level. Next we come to in is another like disclaimer is Matthew 22 verse 29 says Jesus and answered and said to them you are mistaken not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God that's a very important one because if you don't know the scriptures you can't fight the enemy you'll see that in our upcoming sessions um, also we and we go on further it says we know that this was Jesus talking about the one wife who was married to seven brothers. And if you remember in Matthew 28, they the scribes and the Pharisees are trying to corner Jesus. And they're like, okay. They say in 28, therefore, if in the resurrection, whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her. We know that there was seven brothers, one wife. And as a custom during that time, if one, the wife, the husband dies, his brother would now take his place. 
this happened seven times and all died, no children. And then finally the woman dies. So they're trying to corner him. Well, okay, so they go to heaven. Whose wife is it? And Jesus corrected them. There is no marriage in heaven, my friend. So it doesn't matter. This doesn't even matter. They're trying to trap him. And we know the Pharisees were really good at trying to trap him. So that's my disclaimer. So that you know part of the problem with the church today and with people and with ministers and with people trying to walk godly is they don't know. They lack knowledge, just like that first sentence in Hosea 4, 6 says. They lack knowledge. You can't fight an enemy that you know nothing about. If you've been in the military, you know the military is very big about teaching you who the enemy is and his tactics and then how to defeat him. Because you can't defeat him unless you first know him and then you come at him with what you have to fight those tactics and his methods of operation. So today we're going to talk about accusations, okay? An accusation is a charge of wrongdoing. Oh, let's hold on a second. Let's open this in prayer, okay? Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking. And I, I've already prayed. Don't get me wrong. But I want to open this in prayer. Father God, as we come before you talking about accusations, rejection, insecurity, and jealousy, we ask, Father God, that you would open our minds our hearts, Father God, to how the enemy uses these, if it's happening in our life, Father God, that we will be able to come against them. We'll be able to stop it in its tracks. We thank you, Father God. We just give you the honor and the glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So here we go. Accusations. A charge of wrongdoing. The evidence confirms the accusation made against it. Now, think about it. We, we know that uh, many times there where people will bring accusations against you. If you're wrongdoing and the police catch you, let's say you were shoplifting, or maybe you innocently pick something up and put it in your pocket, which has happened. I truly believe there's people that this has happened to, and you go out of the store the store guy comes out, he makes an accusation, okay? And in this accusation, you're not really wrongdoing, okay? But he's only going by what he sees. It's the evidence confirms the accusation was made. He's speaking it, I saw you do this, okay? But now, let's go a little bit deeper. Let's go into the family, because you're going to see a lot of this is going to gear towards... Stuff that's going on in our families, mother, father, sister, brother, aunts, uncles, because that's where the enemy is really having his field day. So in Titus chapter 3, verse 2, it says, To speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, guilt, gentle, showing all humility to all men. And I want you to focus in on that first part, to speak no evil. If someone comes and tells you that your relative has done something you're not really sure if it's true don't go at making that accusation to them because you don't even know if it's true and when you do that you open doors for the enemy to bring in other things as you're going to learn under accusations today you're allowing the enemy to come in and do other things be peaceable not everything is worth a fight, okay? And not everything is worth to bring someone into an accountability, so to speak, for something you don't even know if it's true, okay? So the first part, our first part of this under accusation, his little cloney boys is judging, okay? Judging the act of rendering an authoritative decision, forming an estimate or critical opinion or making or expressing a negative assessment of someone or something. How many people have been guilty of judging? I mean, in reality, we all have, okay? We've all been guilty of this. Making an accusation saying, hey, I know, I heard, I believe what this person said. For whatever reason you think that person makes it justified, 
even if it's not. That's an accusation, my friend. And so, I want to take you to a really important scripture about judging, and one that I, I hope will resonate with you and, and will set in your heart, a very important one. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 through 5, it says, Judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye and look? A plank is in your own eye, hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you'll, you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So first off, let's start with that first part. Judge not, lest you be judged. My friend, if you're ready to go meet your maker, if you're ready to stand before God in judgment, go ahead, judge somebody. But I'm telling you that unless you're ready to be judged for your own fault, turn away. Turn away. Don't get involved in it, my friend. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. Most of the time, when we judge based on what other people say and we don't know the whole or the true story, we can find ourselves in a situation where we're trying to understand how this happened. How did I get wrapped up in this? Who pulled me into this that now I'm, I falsely accused? Remember, we talked about accusations. I falsely accused someone. And if you're in a court of law and this happens, you're going to be judged by that judge because he's going to say that's a false accusation you made so you've made stuff up and you've come against this person for whatever reason so you've been called out well i want to take you deeper if you judge your brother and it comes judgment day and you've judged him for something that maybe you've done in the past maybe it's a lie maybe it's an affair Maybe it's, um, I don't know. You can pretty much think up what you want. But you've done it, and now you're going to judge this person for doing it. That's a hypocrite, my friend. That's a hypocrite. Maybe they lied to their parent. It's a younger person. Their parents are still alive. And they lied to their parents, and you find out, and you're like, Oh, you're, you're going to be cursed because you lied. And you're judging them. But... In reality, you lied. What makes you any better? What I want you to do is I want you to think about that, okay? Because if you die, guess what? There's, there's no more coming back and, and do-overs. It's not like the video game where you can come back and you can do a do-over, okay? So your best bet is not to do it in the beginning. Next we come to Romans chapter 2 verse 3. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those participating such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? So what I'm thinking about here is that these people, and, and we've done it, people have done it, they stole from companies they work for. You may say, well, no. I, I didn't really steal. It was something I was entitled to. Well, if it's not given to you by the company, my friend, it's stolen. If it's not something that is a bonus, it's stolen. If you take it and it's not yours. You can't come against your brother or your sister and judge them and you're just as guilty, okay? You can't do it. Because you if you die, that judgment's going to come upon you. And I'm telling you where you're going to go. And it's called Hades. I'm not saying that you can't correct somebody, okay? I want to make that perfectly clear. But first, make sure that you are not walking in that water. Ask for forgiveness. If you've done something, go to Heavenly Father. Ask for forgiveness. Father God, forgive me. You know, I've made mistakes. I don't know why I did what I did, but I'm sorry and you remove that plank from your eye, then you can go and you can com confront someone else. And you would be legit. 
okay? A lot of times people take this judge not as, as in the church. Well, you know, you can't tell me um, that I can't do this because the Bible doesn't really state it. And the pastor tells you, well, in this scripture, we'll say in Romans 2, 3, we just read, that you can't judge people when you do the same thing. One, it's a hypocrite, okay? Number two, if you're going to do that and you got this plank in your eye, it's going to come back, my friend. It's going to come back and it's going to bite and it's going to bite hard because you can't do that. Now, if you can go ask for forgiveness. Be restored because God is a restorer, okay? You can be restored and then you can go back and you can correct that person. Just like in the church, the pastor, he doesn't judge you when he corrects you. Because the pastor, he has the authority as a pastor when he has a believer. And I want you to key in on this word, believer. You're in this church, my friends, and you're sinning. I can come and tell you, okay, that you're sinning and it's wrong. I'm not judging you. I'm correcting you. There's a difference. And trust me, if I come and correct you, I'm not doing it, okay? I can tell you that because God's going to convict my heart and before I even come and talk to you, I'm going to correct it, okay? Because it's the right thing to do. So next, under accusations, we come to criticism. Everybody loves to criticize people. Criticism is defined as the expression or dis of disapproval of someone or something based on previous faults or mistakes. If you're perfect right now, if you're truly perfect, come criticize me, okay? You have that right, if you're perfect. But we're not, my friends. None of us are, not even myself. We're not perfect. We can't walk it. We can come close. You can be a lover and a follower of Christ, and you can come pretty close. But remember, Satan is out there. John 10.10, 10, the enemy comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. He's out there looking for you, and he's ready to hit you when you start getting a little arrogant and you start criticizing someone else. Something from your past that you didn't confess may come up. And when it comes up, it may totally take you out. That's what's happening in our church today. That's why our church is suffering, is because pastors, they know how to judge and they know how to do it rightly, but they're not cleansed themselves. And so when they come up and they, they judge someone, they haven't cleansed themselves, and that's going to come back because, trust me, Satan's going to use it any way he can. He's going to turn around. He's going to make it known, and it crushes the church. It crushes people's lives. That's why these teachings, why we're doing these demon groups right now. It's so important that we constantly go before the cross, and we get on our hands and knees, and we cleanse ourselves two and three times daily if you have to because the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 1 Peter 5.8 says he roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for you. And the more you allow criticism and arrogance and this stuff to puff, puff up your chest, the more he's prowling and the more he's going to find something going to find something and he's going to bring it out he's going to expose it so we go for James chapter 4 verse 11 and 12 it says and I want you to listen clearly because this is important Okay, do not speak evil of anyone brethren he who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law but if you judge the law you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. This is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? See, judging is when you want to go out there and you want to look at that person and you're going to bring up a fault. And, and oddly enough, our next part is going to be fault finding. And you want to bring it up. You believe in your heart you're doing the right thing, okay? You believe that. But when you speak evil of another person, 
Are you really doing them justice? If you remember last week we, and when we talked about strife, control, and retaliation, I told you that a lot of times in the military, they will call a soldier out and they will try to do peer pressure to get that person, that soldier, to conform to standards. When in reality, that peer pressure doesn't always, it, most of the time it doesn't work, okay? What works is when you take that person in private, and now we're talking about do not speak evil another one. If you know someone's doing something wrong, instead of criticizing them, take them aside. Talk to them. Hey, Brother John, you know what you're saying? That's not really true. I don't, I don't think it's right. Let's discuss it. And by doing this, you're taking it down a notch, but you're also putting that person in a place to where they're not going to get offended because the enemy loves to use people getting offended to come out and to seek, kill, and destroy. He, he loves it because that person, if it's done in public, he's embarrassed. He feels he's belittled. And I want you to key in on that word, belittled. When someone is belittled, they're going to get defensive, and it's only natural, okay? It's only natural that they get defensive. I would get defensive myself. So it's better, even if you don't agree with what I'm saying, set by all means, send me a message, send me an email. If you got my phone number, send me a text. I'm willing to discuss it, but I'm gonna back everything up like I always do with Bible, with the Bible. It's the word of God, it's infallible. Now some people say, well, you know, in our church, they teach the Bible is the final word. Well, my God's not limited to the Bible, okay? I'm just going to say this because I feel like the Holy Spirit wants me to say this. If you can find God to just what's written in that Bible, you're missing out on the, the mighty greatness of the Holy Spirit, healing, deliverance. And by the way, God's got good news, church. And we're founded on deliverance because there are people who are oppressed. There are people who are bound by the enemy and can't break free. Criticism is one of those things that will bind and bind and bind. A person hurt, hears so much criticism in their life, eventually they just don't even participate in life. And so it's important. All this stuff is important, but the Bible is just the basic instruction. Just the basic instruction. As they say, basic instruction before leaving earth. It's really just the basic instruction book. It's God had given the disciples... The, the basic groundwork. And remember, he said that we would do greater things than he did. So if he said that, and granted, you can say, if you want, well, he was talking about the disciples. Well, am I not a disciple of God? I believe. I love God. I serve God. I've dedicated the rest of my life to God. So I'm a disciple. So I have those abilities in me. If I'm willing to accept the responsibilities and to walk the life that God has for Kind of ran it there a little bit because a lot of times people they they want to believe what they want to believe and they they want to take God and put God in a box. My friend, God isn't a box. He created everything, including yourself. He's not a box. Okay, he's outside the box. When you we talk about these demon groupings, we have to think outside the box. Ephesians four twenty nine. Let's see what it says. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. I can tell you that if you're a sinner, you're going to hell. I can tell you that. But I can't just tell you that and leave it. I have to tell you that God is bigger than that. And if you come before him, if you confess your sins, He's going to forgive them, my friend. He says he'll forgive them. There's only one unpardonable sin. And we're not even going to discuss it. There's only one. And if we don't discuss it, then you ain't got to worry about it because most people have never done it. But now the enemy's starting to use it. So we'll eventually talk about it, but not tonight. <laughs> Let no corruption proceed out of your mouth. Don't talk bad about your friends. 
Don't accuse falsely unless you saw it with these two things right here. Because if you haven't seen it, it's a rumor. It's false. It's an accusation. And we already know accusations don't mean anything without backup. Next, we come to fault finding. Fault finding is crit, uh, continual criticism, typical concerning trivial things. So I go out, I get mad at you. I go out and I start digging stuff up. We see this in politics. This is politics, okay? Let's be real. I see that I don't like you. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to look and I'm going to dig. Politicians do that. They dig up the littlest things. It could be something that was from when you was in elementary school or high school that you did. They bring it up because they're trying to discredit you. So they're finding fault in something that, let's be real, we've all been youth, we've all been children, we've all been youth, and we've all been imperfect, okay, in our lives. We all have. None of us are perfect. We can come close walking with God, and we'll, be, we'll get to heaven. There's people in church that are in certain churches that are denominational that are still going to get to heaven because of their belief in God, because of their walk with God. Because they don't go and they don't look for the little faults in people. To look at the bigger picture. That we're all human. That the enemy is out there to steal, kill, and destroy. And as long as we keep that in mind, we never have to worry. Our first verse is 1 John 4, chapter 1. Or first, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. There, we got it right. <laughs> Took a little bit. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. But test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. There's false prophets out there, my friend. And the reality of things is that there's evil spirits out there. There are even spirits, if you've ever visited a necromancy of fortune teller, done Ouija board, any of this stuff, you've opened a demonic door. And until you close that by confessing it, and ask him for forgiveness. That door is open and the enemy is going to use it. It's going to always use it. Because it's there until you shut the door. Okay? Once you shut that door, it's done. It's finished. People use that. If a spirit, if you feel like in your mind, you see something and you're like, I think Bobby Joe is just a little on the lifting things up side, you know, stealing side. I just feel it. I feel like, and you may be a believer and feeling that the Spirit's telling you that this person is a thief or a liar. My friend, don't just buy that lie and run with it. Okay? Because you'll make an accusation and it'll be a false accusation. And it's going to come back. It's going to come back and it's going to burn you. And it's going to burn you so bad that you may not recover. <clears throat> Hopefully, you're able to catch it. How do you catch it? Well, if the Spirit tells you that, you don't have to act on it. Go in prayer. Father God, if it is, if this person is doing this, I just ask Father God that you would open their heart to confess their sins. And if this person, this other person is truly walking with God and trying to have that relationship, they're going to open. They're going to, the Spirit's going to speak to them and they're going to change. I promise you. They will. Believe. Believe. Mark 7 verse 2 says, Now when they saw some of his disciples eating bread <clears throat> with defiled, with defiled, that is, with unwashed hands, they found fault. Why did they found fault? Because religiously, they were told, and, and I say religiously because that is some of our problem in not only in the church, but in, in the walk with Christ. They found fault. They, because they, well, we're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to pay your taxes this day, or you're supposed to pay your car this day. And not understanding that a lot of the stuff that goes on in the church today is religious. <clears throat> um, I can remember I was, uh, my wife and I were talking, and 
Somehow we got in a conversation about length of church time. Now, I grew up not much experience in the church, okay? Most of the times when I went to church, the church service was maybe, uh, I don't know, hour, hour and a half. And I thought, wow, this, see people looking at their watch, you start saying, hey, he must be long-winded. But my friend, that's not true. There's other churches here in the United States. Some of their services are three hours. And you say, well, I don't know if I could sit there for three hours. I'm telling you what, my friend. If the Word of God is feeding you and you're truly seeking and you're hungry, you'll sit there for three to four. We go, if we want to go to other countries, and, and I'm going to say this because this is where most of my knowledge is in Africa, some of those church services are all day. You can't stop the move of God and you can't stop the Spirit of God when He's in action. And why would you? Someone might get healed, someone might get delivered. You may be that person. And so it's important that we focus in and we don't find fault because we think the pastor's long-winded. I'll be honest with you. When I write these sermons, I used to try to sit there and say, okay, I got to remember, I got to keep it within an hour. And then eventually the Holy Spirit was like, for who? God is not confined to a box. If he lays a message on me, and I'm truly going to be obedient to deliver that message, then I have to take whatever time it takes. Because I do a disservice to the church. I do a disservice to God if I don't do what he tells me to do. And you will find fault in me in that if I did that, but I don't. I won't allow that. So our second part today... Another part of what stops your progress is rejection. We've all been rejected, let's be real. I don't think I could find anybody who would say, I've never been rejected by anything. If you have, then you're not looking. You're not looking, or you're a pretty compromised person because you're accepting everything that they put out to you. And if you're a churchgoer, if you're a God-believing, Bible-thumper, whatever you want to call yourself, then you should know that you don't accept everything. You know, I, one time I was reading one of John Eckert's books, and he was talking about that we questioned the Spirit. If you hear a word and you think it's from God and you're not really sure, you question it. And, and so I thought, well, how do I question it? And how do I know I'm getting the right answer? Well, it's simple, my friend. It's simple. Demons will not admit that Jesus Christ died and rose again. They won't admit it. Because they can't. Because it conquers them. That's the power of the blood. That's the power of our God. That's the power that Jesus Christ brought to us as ministers and pastors and fellow believers when we're out there and we're telling people you know what God gives you the authority if you go to Luke 10 19 he gives you the authority over scorpions and serpents and over powers of darkness and they can by no means hurt you that's authority my friend Matthew 18 18 he gives you the authority to bind and loosen that's authority when you have that authority you'll be able to question these spirits and then rejection. People are going to reject you. They rejected Jesus. They rejected Jesus. Let's be real. Now we know rejection is defined. <laughs> we'll go back to the beginning here. <clears throat> we'll go back. Rejection is the power of influence, power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. <sighs> Most people, if you've been in the workforce, you know that if your boss wants you to do something, he's going to say, I want you to do this. You're going to look at him. Maybe you don't want to do it. Maybe it's a dangerous task. And so you don't really want to do it, so you want to steer away from it. And you're like, well, you know, I'll give you a prime example. It just came to me. Thank you, Holy Spirit. I knew a young man who worked for the railroad. In the railroad, he was making like 20 bucks an hour. And this was about 10 years ago. 
Back then, 20 bucks an hour, that's good money for a 20-year-old kid, okay? But they wanted him to ride the truck, pickup truck, mind you, on the rails, because they have that ability to go out 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 miles to do some repairs, and fear gripped him. Fear of, what if a train comes? Well, the train should know he's there if they do it right. But he rejected that from the boss and said, my fear, I can't do it. The boss is like, well, then you don't have a job. And he lost his job, my friend, because he allowed that influence of the enemy of fear to come in and to keep him from now. He would have been there 20 years now. He'd probably be making $30, $40 an hour. He let the enemy to use fear. That's why these demon groupings and what stops your progress is so important because we don't know what stops our progress. Sometimes we don't even look at it. We just act on emotions. And when you act on emotions, my friend, the enemy's going to use it. He's going to use it like you would not believe. He's going to use it. He's going to run with it. He's going to drive it home. Rejection. Our first rejection for tonight is fear. Fear of rejection. You're that young girl, that young boy. You're in high school. You see this cute guy or this cute girl. You want to ask them out. But you don't want to be turned down. I went through that as a kid in school. I'll admit that. That rejection. What if they say no? What if they don't want anything to do with me? The act of rejecting. The state of being rejected. Not given approval or acceptance. You can be rejected in this fear of rejection from a job. It could be from a group of people at the local church. We have fear in church of rejection, my friend. I want to join the praise team. I don't think I'm good enough. I have this fear of rejection. I sing, but I don't feel like I'm good. If you sing for the Lord, my friend, you sing the best voice you could ever sing. Come on up, sing. We'll, we'll turn the equipment up a little bit higher if, you don't, if you're not comfortable. But I'm telling you, this fear of rejection will stop you from stepping in your calling as a believer in Jesus Christ. I can, I'll give you this little tidbit. Those of you who know me who don't know me, I never dreamt in a million years. I don't think I would dream that long, but anyway. Figurative of speech, okay? I'm not given my age. But I never believed that, I never even thought about would I be a pastor standing up in front of people, professing the life of Christ, professing that I love him, I've seen his miracles, he's allowed me to heal, to deliver people. Not by my power, my friend. When I was a kid, I was rejected. I wasn't the handsome boy. Believe it or not, I did have hair, blonde hair, somewhat. But you know, that rejection will steal what God has for you. It'll take it away. And you'll never be able to walk with what God has for you whether it be even just ministering on a job. I know a pastor, a very well-known pastor, who was a flight attendant, who truly walked that life, and God used him to touch people. But if he had fear of talking to people, he never would have gotten there. I'm telling you, this fear of rejection will stop you from going anywhere. Fear will grip a man to stay in his home and never leave it for fear of a disease. As my one of, as a pastor I know says, a pandemic. So I want you to think about that because in John fifteen eighteen it says, "If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you." Jesus Christ 
He told us way in the beginning that if we love him, that if we walk with him, the world is not going to accept us. And there's going to be people, my friends, who hate you, that despise you, that want to come against you, that want to use these things that stop your progress, retaliation or strife or control. But don't let them. Don't let them. Remember that when you walk with Jesus Christ and you are a new creature, the world isn't going to accept you unless they're a fellow believer. And if they're a fellow believer, they're going to cling to you and say, Brother, you're loved. You're loved. Come into the arms of believers. You're loved. And I'm telling you, if you're a young pastor or a young person and you think you're called to ministry and you're like, well, I'm sitting here. In Granville, New York, and I use Granville. I think I can get away with that. And I want to be a pastor. And everybody in that town doesn't look at you only for what you've been. Okay? I'm giving you this. I'm leading up to something, okay? Just stay with me. Okay? Just stay with me. Jesus couldn't teach and couldn't do miracles in Nazareth because they couldn't see him as anything as a, but a carpenter. That's all they could see. If you try to minister in your own hometown and you're not really even called to do it there, you're not going to be successful because Jesus already told you. He already showed you that you're not going to be successful when people can only look at you as what you were, not what you are. What you were. I talked to a, a fellow, a guy who just got out of prison the other day, and I was telling him that now's the time to put that past behind you. Now is the time to remember that's who I was, not who I am. Because the enemy will use this rejection to keep you from entering society and being productive by making you think you're still that inmate or that criminal back then when you're not. You're born again. That's why I'm born again. Think about it. Born again. Out with the old, in with the new. I'm a new creature. I'm a new creature. God didn't say that because he just wanted you to feel good. He wanted you to see that when you're born again, when you come into the life of Christ, you're going to be rejected. But be of good cheer. He's overcome the world. Okay? Be of good cheer. First Peter Chapter 2, verse 4 says, Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. God's going to move you. If he's going to call you, your rejection is not going to be in you because you're going to open up and you're going to let God lead and God guide. And he's with you. He never leaves you, ever. You may feel it at times. You may say, well, Pastor Corey, you don't know. Sometimes I sit at home and, and I cry. I've been there, my friend. I've been there. But be of good cheer. You're not alone. The Heavenly Father is right there. I can remember telling my son, probably about before I got married, he would say, Daddy, I, I get so upset because sometimes I, I go back to Mom and I think about you being home alone and I know you're working, you're in the military, but you're home alone. And I'm like, I'm never alone. My friend, as a Christian, you're not rejected. You're never alone because the Father is always with you. He's just a voice away. But you got to reach out. You got to reach out. You can't let the enemy get a smidgen of you. Not one bit. 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God has not given us a spirit of fear, my friend. He's always with you. The Holy Spirit. See, when you, a lot of people say, well, I got saved. I don't know about the speaking in tongues stuff. My friend, I'm here to tell you the Holy Spirit is real. He's here to help you. Jesus said he sent him as a comforter. And as a comforter, 
He not only comforts you, he speaks to you the word of God. My friend, I'm living proof. When I was younger, I didn't believe in that. Then when I was 14, I shared just this little tidbit with you, not to get us too far off schedule. I don't think we're too far off schedule. No, we're not. When I was 14, I heard someone who was in my life who spoke in tongues. And across that, that church of God, I heard someone interpret it. Most people would tell you, yeah, that it's a show. My friend, I can tell you as I sit here today in my 60s, as that's far as I'll go. As I sit here in my 60s, I tell you today, I have never in my life ever doubted what I heard. Ever. Because God had a calling on my life I didn't know. I'm not going to go into too deep how he revealed stuff to me. But I always remember that, that I never doubted that speaking in tongues, ever. Because when God calls you and he reveals himself to you, he comes in a mighty power. He comes in a mighty power. So when people reject you, be of good cheer. They rejected Jesus. Think about where you're going. I'm going to be with Jesus. <laughs> Reject me all you want, but I'm going to be with Jesus. That comfort of knowing where I'm going. I mean, I like warm weather, but not hell. Okay? Just remember that. Think about that. God is right here. He's willing and ready and able to take you to that next step. But are you willing, ready, and able to open your heart to let him put that fear of rejection out of the way my friend because the world doesn't care and if you can today sit there and tell me you can't see the enemy working in this world your eyes are blind just like that blind man Jesus had to put the mud on for him to go get him washed so he could see you're like that blind man you can't see because it's prevalent today. You can see it in our society. You can see it in our children. You can see it in our grandchildren. You can see the, the misunderstanding, the misidentities of them where the enemy convinces them they can be anything they want when they can only be one thing, and that's a child of God. It's a child of God. Think about it. Think about all the killings and stuff going on today the people families why would a father kill his daughters to conceal his own arrogance and irresponsibility see and if you can't see evil in that then you're rejecting what god is making our eyes open to if you're a believer in jesus christ right now you know what i'm saying is true all you got to do is open the the paper now well, paper's kind of old. Just go on YouTube, go to Google, you, uh, Yahoo Mail, whatever, Yahoo, and you see that what I'm telling you is correct. This world, my friend, the end is coming. My heart is that you not be one of those ones who don't make it. My heart is that you make it. That you get delivered. I didn't choose deliverance ministry. Heavenly Father chose it for me because he knew what I was good at. He trained me for 30 years in the military to be able to understand the enemy and to understand his tactics and then to devour him, to pull him out, to get rid of him. I carried on a little bit there, my friend. I'm sorry, I'm passionate about this. We don't see because we want to put blinders on. Oh, wait. Yeah, I can't really see anything now, so I must be right. No, my friend, we have to look. We have to be real. Now is not the time to say, well, you can believe that if you want. No. No, no, no. Now is not the time to let your children go and do whatever they want to do and tell them it's okay. 
because it's not. We should desire that our children come to know the Lord, they come to be in love with the Lord, and they do what God has for them. Yes, they can have a life more abundantly. John 10.10, 10, the second part, says that he comes that you may have life and have more abundantly. God's already taken and changed what the enemy has tried to do. He's already changed it. Even in 1 Peter 5 eight, in chapter verse 9, he tells you that you can resist the devil. You can flee. I've had to learn that myself. All right. Let's go to the next part. I'm telling you, I'm passionate about what God is doing. I'm passionate that we have a chance now to make a difference. Our next one is, and this is a big one, my friends. This I have fallen into this category myself as a young man. Self-rejection. Self-rejection is defined as the act of rejecting yourself to avoid others rejecting you. Well, if I don't go and put myself out there as a, as a believer in God, then people can't tell me, you're not a believer of God, you're a liar. So I don't put myself out there. I don't put it out to my family because I don't want my family to know because of rejection. I don't want them to reject me as believing in God or call me some holy roller. I can remember my dad using that term. Campground was not when we were raised on the farm. Down the road was, was a church of God campground. And I can remember my dad been during the weekends and summers. It'd be like all kinds of noise. And my dad would say, stay away from those holy rollers down there. My friend, I realized today I should have been with the holy rollers. Things would have been different. But no, God has me where he wants me, doing what he wants me to do. And hallelujah for that. But self-rejection will cause you not to step out of your comfort zone. When I got stationed here in El Paso, Texas, back in 2006, the Army gave me this little paper, you're going to El Paso, Texas, and I looked at it and I'm like, uh, I don't even know where that is. I'll be honest with you. I've been to California. I just didn't know where El Paso was. Now I know and I understand today that by opening myself up and allowing God to move in my life is where I'm at today because I didn't have self-rejection. I accepted what the army sent me and I came here. And as God moved in my life, things started to change. And when I moved here, I'd just coming out of Iraq. You know, I bad experiences. I didn't really want to come here. I was comfortable where I was at. When you're out of your comfort zone, God will use you, my friend. He will use you. I'd been in Fort Stewart for seven years. So people knew me. I could pretty much go and do stuff. People knew who I was. But when God's moving you and he wants you to work for him, he's going to move you to another area take you out of that comfort zone. You can't self-reject being in a new area. Well, you could keep yourself in a little cocoon, but that's not who I am. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. Now, you may say self-rejection. God created all of us with something in mind for each one of us. He made women specifically for childbearing because most men could not handle it. They may think they could handle it, but they can't. It's not God's design. It's not God's design for a woman to labor and be the breadwinner because the husband just is too lazy not God's design we'll come we'll do a teaching about that setup of man woman and child I've done it before I just hadn't put it out there on any kind of broadcast because some people get offended my friend I don't care if you get offended I'm preaching what's in the Bible I'm teaching you what's in the Bible not for me for you because out of love 
to keep you from self-rejecting yourself, to keep you from not going out and doing what God has called you to do. I'll even give examples of myself, and you know, in my teachings, I'm not afraid to put myself out there. I'm not afraid. Luke 6.22 says, Blessed are you when men hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you and cast you out and cast out your name as evil for the sake son of man's sake so if someone boots you out they reject you because you're a man of God a woman of God maybe you believe in deliverance maybe you don't but I'm, I'm, if you're a true believer in God you have to believe in the whole Bible not just parts of it that's important for people to understand. You have to believe in the whole Bible, just not in parts of it. And when you do that, you'll see God move and you'll, you won't you will self-reject yourself. I'm telling you right now. I could so easily, when I first got into ministry, just say, you know what? I don't want to deal with people. I've dealt with them my whole army career. And then when I worked for the federal government, I dealt with them for another 12 years. I just don't want to deal with people. But that's not what God had for me. God knew something different. God knew something different. And praise God that he never gives up on you. He never gives up on me. We go to 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. The Heavenly Father cares for you. He doesn't want you to suffer. And self-rejection and not putting yourself out there will not allow you to grow as a believer in Jesus Christ, okay? I'm just going to say that right now because some people go, well, you know, it's going to stop you from growing. Step out. Don't be afraid. The next one is insecurity. Insecurity, uncertainty, or anxiety about oneself. Lack of confidence. We all know that lack of confidence can stop you from excelling. And, and I can tell you that when I went to college, and I never thought I would go to college, I never thought I was good enough to go to college because of self-rejection. Figured I didn't complete high school, what good was college gonna do me? And I can tell you right now that once I got over that self-rejection and I stepped out, and I saw how, how I was able to excel, not on Dale's merit, but on God's merit. Song of Solomon 4.7 says, You are all fair, my love, and there is no spot in you. See, God loves us the way we are. And if you believe in the potter's wheel, you'll believe that God molds us, Okay. And as he's molding us and he's turning, he's creating what he wants us to be, my friend. What he wants us to be, not what we think we should be. Because we'd all want to be millionaires, but we can't. And besides, that would corrupt us. That's the real of it. It would corrupt you. But God loves you because we're all fair. There's no spot in us according to God. We come to the first part of insecurity is inferiority. Inferiority is the condition of being lower in statute or quality than another or others. Insecurity in this inferiority spirit, this inferiority spirit will convince you that you're not good enough. Maybe there's something you want to do in your life. Maybe you feel called to be a doctor and you're like, oh man, I, I really want to be a doctor. But then this inferiority spirit comes in through your life. Through It can be through rejection, insecurity, fear. And he convinces you that you're not good enough. You can't be a doctor. You can barely um, write a letter. And so that inferiority is going to keep you 
confined, my friend. You're going to come along with self-rejection because you're not going to feel good enough. But you are when you walk in Christ. You're good enough. And you'll be what God wants you to be if you put your faith, your trust, and your love in Christ. We go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We're all the same, my friend. We're all cut from the same cloth, the same DNA that God created. We really are. We're his children. We're his descendants. And we're meant for a time like this. You're not inferior. You may be rough around the edges. You may not have grown in certain areas, but you don't have to accept that. You can change that. You can change it. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. See, we may feel we're inferior, but when we allow God to come into our life, when we allow God to mold us, that potter's will, if you remember, that potter's will, we allow God to bring us to that point of perfection. In Him, not in us. In Him. Then we're able to do. We won't be lower status, lower quality. We'll be the quality that God wants us. Because God does not create inferior quality like some countries. Best of the best. Next, we come back to, remember we talked in the last part about self-rejection. Now we're coming to part of Dale's problem, self-pity. Self-pity, excessive self-absorbed unhappiness over one's own trouble. And what came to mind when I was writing this was Jonah. You know, Jonah didn't want to go and do God's will. And we thought because the thing that they would, they would reject it. But see, it really wasn't that. It was self-pity. Because he knew they would repent. And he didn't want them to. For whatever reason. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, it says, In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. See, we can waller in self-pity. We can take ourselves down so low that we can become suicidal in self-pity. But it's not God's design for us. The enemy uses it because he has something deeper in mind that he wants to steal from. 1 Corinthians 10 13 says, and this, and, and I put this in here because I want you to see that there is hope in all this we're talking about. There is hope. God didn't bind us. He gave us a way to have freedom. And in 1 Corinthians 10 13, he says, No temptation has overtaken you, such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation, will all the ways will also make a the way of escape that you will not be able that you may be able to bear. See, we go through times and seasons. The enemy will bring stuff on you. Maybe it's a previous. Maybe you're addicted to pornography. Send me a text. We can work with you on that. Maybe you're addicted to alcohol. Or drugs and you you've been clean maybe you've been clean for a month or two months three months and now all of a sudden the enemy has thrown its weary head and card in the game to try to bring you back because that's what he's gonna do my friend that's what he's gonna do but you just got to remember first Corinthians 10 13 no temptation has overtaken you you accept such as common to man. Everybody goes through it, my friend. Everybody is tempted. 
What separates you from them, from the people who fall back into it, is that God is there to help you, to pull you out. He wants to pull you out. He desires to pull you out. But you have to hang on. You have to hang on. And the more you hang on, it'll get easier. The next time the enemy comes and tries to tempt you, be like, get out of here. Wasting your time. Another one of the spirits that come out is loneliness. Loneliness is the sadness because one has no friends or company. And we're going to start off with this with 1 Chronicles 28, 20. And David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and of good cheer, of good courage, and do it. Do not fear or be dismayed, for the Lord God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. See, God doesn't leave you. He never leaves you. You're not lonely. Don't let the enemy convince you that it's just you. I learned this a long time ago, my friend. I learned this a long time ago, that if I'm in Christ and I'm walking, I got the Heavenly Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus. That's three plus me. And there's three in me, mind, body, and spirit. Mind, body, and soul, excuse me. I apologize. So we're a group. And even if you just take me out of the picture and put me as an individual, I still got Jesus, I still got the Holy Spirit, and I still got God. So I'm not alone. The enemy will convince you you need all these people around you to make you not lonely. My friend, if, if you've ever been sad or suffered with depression, you know that's a lie from the pits of hell because you can be in a full group of people and be alone. You can be in a whole group. You can be in a stadium at a football game and be alone. I just want you to think about that. Because you're never alone with the Heavenly Father. Ever. Deuteronomy 4.31 says, For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to you. See, God is a God of law why we had the Ten Commandments. That's why Jesus came back and reiterated a new version of the Ten Commandments in the Sermon on the Mount. It's not to, to call you out or to make you feel like things are wrong and you're just a, you know, you're a bad person alone. He did it to let you know how much he loves you. And if a father or a mother loves their children, they're not going to leave their children. stuff and I'm like in, in my own mind I'm thinking why do you let your child do that Won't you? and a lot of stuff my friend is because the enemy sets us up from the beginning if you don't raise a child in the word of God they're going to be conformed to the world but if you raise them up and discipline them yeah there's going to be times they're going to be mad at you times they're going to be like right that's not right let's be steadfast my friend your children only have one life just like you you want them to have the best and the only way they're going to have the best is you're going to have to be the best parent the only way you're going to be the best parent is that if you walk with jesus christ and you allow him to be your guide in raising your children and trust me even if they walk away they'll come back it says so in the bible and the bible is true Next we have timidity, timidity, lack of courageous or confidence. We have a lot of people now that are not confident in who they are. We can see it. We can see it with our gender people. Though their pronouns and they're lost, they don't even know who they are because they have no courage or confidence in who they are, what God made them to be. I took this out of Numbers 13, 26 to 33. Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron 
and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told him and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The, um, the Amalekites dwell in the land in the south, of the south. The Hittites, the Jezebites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quietly quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are able to overcome it. But the men who had gone with them, with him, said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. They, and they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There was there we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, come from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. So we were in their sight. And I put this in here, and and it really, as you're going to see, we're talking about. They have a lack of courage. They have the lack of courage and confidence. When, when Israelite was going into were going to the promised land, and they stopped there and they looked, <clears throat> they sent out their spies to see if they could check out the land. We see that the true believers in in what God had told them came back and said, "Let's go. Let's not waste a minute. We can take this hill. It is ours, and we'll have the victory." But then you have the people that have no confidence. They have no confidence in their own ability. And more than that, the fact that God said it was theirs. God said it was theirs. So that means all they had to do was walk and take possession. I believe that would have been a piece of cake for them. But they, the people believed the bad report. They got scared. They lacked confidence. They lacked confidence they didn't have any courage to believe in the Word of God. We'd already seen what, what God had done with Moses. So we know that God is, is, is a mighty God and he's going to do what he says. But you got to walk in it, okay? Come to Deuteronomy 28. That's chapter 20, verse 8, okay? Sometimes I say 28. People go, what verse? It's chapter 20, verse 8. The officers shall speak. Speak further to the people and say, What man is there who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return to his house, lest the heart of the brethren faint like his heart. See, if you don't have courage to stand up against Satan and his followers, you're not going to win. If you can't fight these these demonic spirits, these demon spirits that we've been talking about for the last four weeks. You're not going to be able to overcome them, my friend. You're not going to be able to overcome them. You have to have courage. You have to stand up and fight anything. That To have a victory, you have to fight. It's not just given to you. God is your supporter. And if you put on the armor of God in Ephesians 6, 11, and 12, remember those. Put on the armor of God. You'll stand against the whales of the enemy. He'll think he's beating you down, but he ain't. Because you got more to your game. Because you're backed by the Heavenly Father. Okay? So now we come into shyness. Shyness is something that a lot of people today probably struggle with more than anything, I think. 
quality or state of being shy. Hebrews 13, 2 says, Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, for by doing so, doing some have unwittingly, unwittingly entertained angels. Think about that. Someone says, hey, you should go up and give that uh, homeless guy, you know, a bag of groceries or some food. And you're like, man, I'm not going to have to him. You think I'm crazy or something. Oh, I can't do that. That's too much. That's out of my comfort zone. But my friend, that could be an angel. We don't know. If you can believe in heaven and hell, angels and demons, you can believe that an angel can be on this earth. And for whatever reason God has, because it's up to God, it's not up to us. You go and you entertain that angel. God knows. God sees what you do. You may not think it, but God sees what you do. 1 Peter 3.15, chapter 3, verse 15 says, but sanct sanctify the Lord God in your heart and always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. A lot of times people, unbelievers, will come up to you and they're going to call you out. They're going to say, how can you believe in a God you can't see? And you're going to sit there and say, well, it's really easy. I know what he does seen him move in my life he's a mighty God his word comes true what he what he says I can do I can do and I've done when you do that you're standing up you're taking that shyness ain't in you okay because you're standing up for the word of God and you may even have experience well, I was a drug addict you know and and I came to the Lord and I gave my life to the Lord and he saved me he saved me he cleansed me he took the smoking out of me I smoke worse than probably a lot of people but he took it out of me every bit when I give it up I give it to him and I accepted what he had for me and by doing that he cleansed me my friend he cleansed me can do that for you if you let him. It's been 14 years, I think. He can do that for you. And I can boldly say that to you because it is a fact. It's even medical records that I had a spot on my lung. And when I prayed that night, I threw everything away. I said, Father God, if this is what takes my life, I accept it. I blame no one but myself. And in doing that, Heavenly Father was able to heal me because I didn't try to blame people. I accepted my responsibility. God can do mighty things when you accept responsibility for your actions. Our next one is inadequacy. The state or quality of being inadequate, lack of the quality or quantity required. We can always say we're inadequate. But God isn't inadequate. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says, And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And I just gave you an example of that about the smoking. That's an example of it. When I allowed, just like it says here, God's grace was sufficient. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, okay? So don't say I misquoted the Bible. When I allow God's grace for me, for my strength and my weakness of being addicted to the nicotine, most gladly, I can, I rather boasted in my infirmity. I told people two packs a day, more or less, probably more sometimes, but that the power of Christ rested upon me and healed me, took it all away. He did that because I
because that spirit of inadequacy was finished. It was defeated. It was done. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellent power of power, excellence of the power may be of God, not in us. I didn't quit smoking. God took it from me. You can say what you want. That's what I know. He took it from me. He took the desire, every bit of it, and even cleansed my lungs. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Our last one for tonight is jealousy. Now, I know we're running a little short on time as I look here, but uh, my friends, I want to stick around because jealousy is a major power behind this jealousy and it is in our families our children our grandparents the workforce the workplace anything even when you go to the store jealousy feeling or showing envy of someone or their achievements or and advancements witchcraft jealousy is strong in, in associated with witchcraft people will remember proverbs 18 21 Life and death is in the power of the tongue. People will speak evil on other people. Curses, word curses. That's witchcraft. Say what you want, believe what you want. That's witchcraft. They'll speak it against someone and then turn around and when someone calls them out, they'll go, well, I didn't really mean it. Well, then don't say it because it's out there. It's witchcraft. The enemy grabs it and he's got it because you spoke it. James 3.16 says, for where evil, where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every little evil thing are there. Let me read that again. I was a little tongue-tied a little tad. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. When you're jealous of someone, you think that what they have they don't really deserve but it could come from God Proverbs 27 4 says wrath is cruel anger a torment but who is able to stand before jealousy and I'm going to give you a biblical example we're not going to go too deep in it I just want to give you something I feel like I'm compelled to give you at Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel out of jealousy because God didn't accept his gift. And you may say, well, why didn't he? Well, because at that time, it was so easy that Cain could have went and asked Abel for an animal. And he would probably would have gave it to him. He may have even exchanged some fruit. It's irrelevant. But he could have went and then gave that a perfect animal. And been in the same grace, but he didn't want to do it. Pride, whatever you want to call it. He gave him something that God had cursed, the ground, stuff from the ground. Just dwell on it, chew on it, think about it. Now we come to envy, a feeling of discontent or resentful longing aroused by someone else's possessions, qualities, or luck. We know a lot of people envious, huh? <laughs> a lot of people envious. You don't need to be. 1 Peter 2.1 says, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. You can't be envious if someone's successful. Maybe they come out with a gimmick or something that's sold. It's a safe thing, but it, they sold it and they made money off it. You, you should be happy for them. You should be happy for them. And then ask God, to, hey, is there something I can do? And there may be something. But because of these demonic spirits working in your life, envy, you're not going to get there. Get it out. Mark 7, 20 to 23. That's chapter 7. And he said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man? For from within, out of the heart of men, Proceeds evil thoughts, adultery, fornication, murders, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, 
lawless lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, and the, these things come from within and defile a man. See, everything comes from within here. Satan tries to plant all like we're entitled. We're entitled. Why, why should my neighbor have a brand new truck? Why can't I have a new truck? I work hard. I, I feel that I truly should have that. But you don't. So you want to you wanna be upset against your neighbor for being successful. Cast that envy spirit out right now, my friend. And let God give you what he wants you to have. And you may have that and even greater. But you won't know because you've got to get rid of envy. The next part under this little grouping of jealousy, one of his little demons is distrust. The feeling that someone or someone or something cannot be relied upon. People would say that with the word of God. Can't be relied upon. It's just a book written by people. <clears throat> but they'll believe a history or a physics book, which is a book written by people. <laughs> See, we get to pick and choose what we want to believe. <laughs> Psalms 146.3 says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. Guys, trust in the Lord. Get that distrust out of you. If you have distrust about something, go to the Father in prayer because the enemy will hold that on you. He'll hold that on you. He'll tell you, oh, that person's a thief. Don't trust him. Don't trust him. And it could be working with another spirit. But you have to be open to that. Psalms 53, 3 and 4 says, Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you, in God. I will praise his word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? What can flesh do to me? There's so much distrust right now in the church. They really, uh, a lot of, uh, and, and I'm going to spend a, a second on this, okay? I know we're getting towards that eighth hour. But we know that distrust in the church, one thing that people do is they go, well, the church wants my money. All they ever do is ask before service for tithes and offerings. And then they'll come against tithes, oh, tithes not biblical. Or they'll come against offerings saying they just ask him for money. I'm going to tell you this, my friend. In relation to this. Number one, I pay tithes because I want to. You don't have to, okay? Because I want to. I feel it's right. And mine, I base on Malachi. Or, I'm sorry, on Mal um, <clears throat> Melchizedek with Abraham. You do it because he wanted to do it. Abraham paid a tithe because he wanted to. And I want to. It's blessed me, I'll tell you that right now, more than anything. And then as far as um, giving, my friend, if I have, I, I could use Hebrews 13, 16. If you have extra stuff, you're supposed to give. It's pleasing to God. That's a paraphrase. But So if I have, why can't I give? The church has to function. It needs money to function. A pastor, who's paying him? Where's the money coming from? Unless it comes into the church. Don't down that pastor if he's asking for all. People give, and do you know that when you give, you receive? I'm living proof. When you give, you receive. So if someone says, comes up to me and says, Pastor Corey, I want to give the church $100. We're going to pray over that $100. I'm not asking you for it. I'm going to tell you right now, in this ministry here, we don't ask for money. You'll never hear me say, send me a $1,000 check and I'll pray for you. Buddy, I'm going to pray for you if you just send me an email. I'm going to pray for you as, the, as for anybody else I pray for, no matter what they do. If you have a need and you put that need to me in this church, we're going to pray for it because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do. If someone asks you to pray for them, you don't ask for money, do you? 
we're not going to either. It's not what the church is for. It's not what ministry is about. God provides and meets the needs because he'll lay on people's hearts to give. I don't have to ask. He'll lay it on their hearts. They'll give from here. I'd rather have it from here. And that you receive the blessing. He's blessed me. I'm telling you. I could go on and on. I could do a whole two-hour teaching on blessing me. But let's go forward, all right? <laughs> we see distrust in the family, too. Everybody's out to get something. Grandma dies. Everybody's out to get something. Everybody moves near uh, their parents when their parents are sick and ill because they're looking for something. They distrust another family member that they might reach in and steal it. I can tell you this, and I say this. I hope my family members are watching. My family's not like that. I can honestly sit here today and tell you that my family is not like that. Out of anything I can brag for on my family, I can tell you they're not greedy people. Not that my parents had a lot, but my family didn't fight over. See, distrust when people start looking. Now, a, 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 a man should set stuff for his children. Husband and wife should have stuff set for their children. Equally. So there is no distrust over who gets what. We call them wills. Okay? So now we come into our last one tonight before closing. Selfishness. Lacking consideration for others. Concerned chiefly with one's own personal profit or pleasure. That's selfishness. We have a lot of it in this world today. We have a lot of it in the church. Behind the scenes in the church and businesses and government. Selfishness. Philippians 2, 4 says, Let each of you look, not, look out not only for his own interest, but for the interest of others. Selfishness means if I if I'm if I'm selfless, I'm gonna do what God tells me to do, and if my neighbor needs, I'm gonna meet his need. You come to this church, you tell me you need food, we're gonna help you. Selfless. We're not selfish with what God has given the ministry to give this church. It belongs to the people that are hungry, the people in need, the widows. We're commanded to support widows. And one of my favorites that I'm going to read to you right now, and this is against selfishness, okay? It's, it's a program we have here in the church. It's called Good News uh, Thursday, where we give out groceries to those who need, and it's a bag of groceries and it could last two three days but to get people to Friday to help them to get to Friday payday around here anyway and it comes from Hebrews 13 16 I paraphrased this earlier now I'm gonna read it to you but do not forget to do good and to share for with such sacrifices God is well pleased I'm not here to please men I'm here to please God Okay, so if I have extra and you come by the church and you say, oh, pastor, I'm hungry. I have bags for individuals, but then I have groceries. They're not mine, my friend. They belong to the people in need. Okay, they belong to people in need. People say, well, do you met people have to come to your church to get it? No, no. I've given bags away of groceries to people just because I've asked them, do you need groceries? My wife and I and daughter will be out, do you need groceries? Would you accept a bag of groceries? Oh, yes, sir, thank you. We really need it. My friend, the only requirement for, the, for this is that you eat it or give it to someone who will eat it. That's it. No selfishness there. Next, we come to 1 John 3.17. But whoever has this world's, world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, he does not have the love of God abide in him. 
How does the love of God abide in him? Sorry. Apologize for that misreading. If you see someone hungry and you know they're hungry, if they're standing on the street sign, hold out that little sign, I'm hungry, I need food, and you drive by and you got food and you give it to them. Now, my friend, this is the hard part. You give it to them, they take it, they throw it away. My friend, then they ain't hungry. And you won't fall for it again, I promise. Because God has revealed to you. But if they take it and they put it next to them and they're like, okay. Like I gave a man a bag one day and I said, here, I, you know, it's just a, a snack. It's a day snack at best. And he said, thank you, sir. And he put it next to him and said, God bless you. And that's all I need, my friend. Even if he doesn't eat it and he gives it away, he's not throwing it away. And God's shown me that there's a heart there. There's a spirit there. And that I may have planted a seed in that spirit. And it comes against this spirit of selfishness. So selfishness can't come in me. He can't attack me because I've already found him. So in closing today, I know we went a little longer. But we need to hear this. And this last part you need to hear too. How do we win against these things we just talked about? Because, you know, the enemy's going to attack. He's going to try to put all this stuff in you. Because he can. This is his world. He has control over it. You may say, well, I thought God created it. He did. But remember, Satan, this is his dominion right now. It will not last forever. But that right now, this is his dominion. First one is James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Any of this stuff creeps up on you, my friend, that we talked about tonight? Resist it. Resist it. The enemy has to flee. The devil has to flee. He can't stand in it. It's in the Word of God. John 10, 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. So when the enemy tries to seek or to steal, kill, and destroy, all you got to remember is, hey, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. God says I'll have life more abundantly. Maybe you get in a car accident. You're looking at, oh, I got to pay this. Oh, you don't realize I didn't really have the money to pay it. God will provide. If you're walking with God, my friend, he will provide. Be a good cheer. He's overcome the world. How about 1 Peter 5, 8, 9? I know we talked about this earlier. Kind of like paraphrased it, but let's read it now in its content. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in faith, knowing that the same suffering has happened to the brotherhood in the world. You're not alone. People say, well, you don't understand what I'm going through. I might not extend, understand exactly what you're going through, but my friend, I, if I get you in a meeting, 100 people or more, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure there'll be someone who's been through it. I'm pretty sure. Because the enemy runs rampant in this world to seek, to steal, kill, and destroy. He roams around like a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for you. But be a good cheer. God's overcome it all. All you got to do is resist. Another one. I want you to remember this. This is Luke 10, 17, and then verse 19. 17 says, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Did you hear what I just said? Even the demons are subject what you tell them in the name of Jesus. You tell them to flee. They have to flee. If they're stubborn, then that means there's other things. You may have to deal with something in your life you don't want to deal with, my friend. But maybe it's time that you deal with it so that you can go forward. Maybe that's what has stopped you. But you can overcome it. Verse 19 says, Behold, I've given you authority to trample on serpents, sort on serpents and scorpions, and over the powers of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. See, you are a one. You have the authority. 
But you have to take that authority and you have to come at the devil with the vengeance of the Lord. You cannot accept what he tells you. You have the authority. People don't want to walk in that authority. Well, if I'm... I don't, want, I don't want people to think I'm uh, this weird holy roller. Well, guess what? If you love God and you're serving God, you're not going to care what people think, okay? You're just not going to care. It's not even going to affect you. Our last scripture for today is Psalms 34, 17 to 20. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of their trouble. Trouble is the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have a constrained spirit. Many are of afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones. No, excuse me, not one of them is broken. See, we have this power. We don't want to walk in it. We want God to, to just do everything, and, and we're like, well, you know, God, I know you love me, but uh, and I love you, and I know you do the, these great and wonderful things, and I, Lord, I just know that I have victory in you, and I'm really, I just, I want to fight the enemy, Father God, but I want to do it where it's not costing me anything, or I want to do it where people can't see what I'm doing. Well, my friend, the enemy is going to crush you. It's going to crush you. I'm just going to tell you like it is. The enemy is going to crush you. And he's going to crush you because you allow him. You allow him to crush you. The Bible has given us, it's an infallible word of God and it gives us everything we can fight everything with. We don't have to accept anything, any of it. The, what we talked about today, the accusations, the rejection, insecurities and jealousies and their little memes that fall underneath them are just the beginning of what the enemy tries to do. There's 52 groupings. I haven't even touched, I think as of today, we might have touched nine groups out of the 52. But I only tell you this, and I'm not trying to create fear in you, because some of these spirits use other spirits <clears throat> underneath them. Under these groupings, jealousy might use something that's under accusations. He might use something that's under a spirit of death or fear. Because they're all working together. Their, their whole work is to destroy you, to put you in bondage and to destroy you. So I hope you enjoyed tonight. Next week we're going to talk more about we're going to we're going to back off of the demon groupings. We'll come back to the rest of them. I promise. We're going to now switch gears, and I, I, in the same thing, we're still talking about what stops your progress, but now I want to get more into how they enter. And I think next week the it'll main the main part will be on how they enter. And through scripture, because you know everything, as you see, everything I back up, I back up with scripture. This is not Dale's opinion or anything. And I, and I do do my due diligence in researching this. But I just want you to know that it's time to now show you how they get in. We've talked about them, and, the, and that they stop your progress. So now let's look at how they get in. And, and I'm not even going to elaborate right now because I got a feeling if I do, I will be here another hour or two. And, uh, and as some of you on the East Coast, it's kind of late, okay? And I understand that. Okay? Some people here ready to go get some sleep, right? God bless. God bless. So, as we close today, listen to this teaching again. Send it to your friends. Let them listen to it. Because the enemy is real. The enemy does seek to steal, kill, and destroy. And he'll use your closest friends, relatives, family. You have to be on your game. But be a good cheer. You're not doing it alone. Heavenly Father is with you. Father God, as we close tonight, we just thank you. Father, we give you the honor and the glory. 
for revealing to us and allowing us to reveal to others some of these groupings and and how the enemy is intertwined to use different things to open doors for different things we may think it comes through something comes through accusation and later on find out it comes to it came through hatred that just shows the complexity of the enemy father god and in that we have to be a good cheer father because you've overcome it all the enemy has no power over the authority in the name of jesus christ we just thank you father god we glorify you in the mighty name of jesus thank you father god may everyone that hears this message may their heart be enlightened and be of good cheer father god that there's hope we just thank you and praise you in jesus name amen so come join us again um like i said next week we'll uh we'll go a little more into how these demons come in and be ready because it, it will be deep not real deep okay but it'll be to where you'll start to see how things happen in your life and how they the enemy tries to win god bless you we'll see you next week i can say shalom right amen